Welcome to Coffee, Culture, and the Capital with Sophia and Greg. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. It has been a minute since we've been here on the podcast, but Greg, what are some of the fun things we've been doing, um, some events and stuff like that that's kind of caused us to not have the podcast for a couple of weeks? Well, we had the March for Life. That was a fabulous uh, event, a great success. Um, we even got some good press coverage. Uh, and so we've been doing that. I, I was at a Heritage Foundation action event over the weekend uh, in, uh, where is that? Near Carmel, um, talking about parental rights. And what else? What else have we been doing? It just seems like we haven't had a chance to sit down and do a podcast when so much has been happening, um, but we finally did. And so, of course, there's lots to catch up on. What have you been up to? Yeah, well, the March for Life, that was, like you said, a great event, a major event. And then right after that, we had our press conference outside the Capitol. Uh, I think two days after the March for Life, it was a press conference about a positive bill in regards to pregnancy centers. We've talked about That's that right. bill on the podcast before. It did really die, but... Um, if you go to our YouTube page, you can see more about that hearing. It was SB 1368. And overall, pregnancy centers were talked about in a positive way at the Capitol, and there wasn't anyone attacking them. So that was definitely a win on that angle. But the bill did, unfortunately, die. And yeah, we've just had events after events. But we're finally here to catch you guys up on what's been going on. So for Greg, there has been a major bill that we have been fighting for, which is awesome that we've had some legislation this year that's positive legislation we've been supporting. This is AB 3080, and it's a pretty simple bill to understand. It's just age verification for online pornography. But Greg, why don't you kind of walk us through what is going on with that bill, where it's at, and maybe go through some of the lies or misinformation that's been spread about that bill. Well, yes, this is a, a, a positive thing that's actually happening here in the Capitol. Um, we are pleasantly surprised about how much support this bill has. Uh, this bill is is something, it's a, been repeated all over the country. We have, I think, up to 17 states that have passed age verification laws for pornographic websites. These are websites that are, are selling hardcore pornography and many of these websites, especially here in California, they don't age verify. So they don't check to see if uh, those who are going on the website are under age. Now, you know, there's a long history of legal precedent uh, that states have implemented laws to protect minors from indecent immaterial, right? I mean, uh, you can, we always have ratings on our movies, you know, we don't let underage kids go see even rated R movies. Uh, and so it would seem simple enough, um, that, you know, these pornography websites where most of the pornography of people are viewing these days is online, that there's no protection, uh, for minors. And if anybody's got kids and they got access to computers, parents are always worried that they're going to stumble across across a website uh, of pornography. And it's kind of hard. Filters don't always work. And so we're trying to hold these uh, organizations that are selling pornography accountable, um, just like alcohol, pe people selling alcohol online or, uh, or gambling online. They have to verify the ages of those who are using those products. Why shouldn't pornography websites? And so uh, the bill uh, has been introduced by a Republican, um, uh, Assemblyman uh, Juan Annalise, and it has been through the Privacy Committee uh, in the Assembly. It got, I believe it was 10 to 0, it passed, and then it went through the Assembly Judiciary Committee, and we got 11 to 0. So it's been great to see that both sides of the aisle acknowledge that kids should not be exposed to pornography uh, and companies need to do a better job of making sure uh, th their product is not being seen by minors but there's no incentive for these pornography websites to keep minors off they want customers long term they want to make long-term customers and they want kids to get hooked on it when they're young um, and so there's no incentive for them to keep kids off the website 
And so there is new technology out there that's being used around the world, especially in Europe, uh, that can age verify online uh, in a way that doesn't uh, violate privacy. And so those type of technologies are ready to be activated here. And so at this point, the bill is ready to be voted on by the full assembly. And we expect that to happen on uh, next this coming week. Um, so next Monday. So we're, we look forward to this bill keeping uh, on the roll. Of, of course, we got pornography organizations upset. Uh, they're making a lot of free speech arguments because the Constitution does protect adults' access to pornography. And so they don't want to have any, uh, in, in anything inhibit the a free access of pornography for adults. And so, uh, but in Texas, the same law had passed and a federal court's already upheld this and said it's no different than a 7-Eleven who um, puts up uh, protections on the pornography behind the uh, counter and covers it up and requires uh, you to have an ID to uh, hand out the pornography. So mm -hmm. we, we, are, we are hopeful that uh, this is going to pass and um, excited that we're finally agreeing here uh, in California about uh, the harmful effects of pornography. Absolutely. At least on minors. Yeah. <laughs> we would say it's harmful on anyone, but at least here in California, they, they consider minors that uh, uh, they shouldn't be seeing it. So. Well, and if you're kind of been paying attention to this bill or this is your first time hearing about it right now, you might be thinking, is there really that many minors that are getting access to porn, watching porn? And um, mm -hmm. the hearing the different testimonies on this bill has honestly been heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Being involved in this work, I know that there is a lot of underage or minors. There's too many people in general watching porn but there is a large amount of minors. And not only is there a large amount, it has extreme negative effects. And so Heidi Olson was one of the people who testified during the first hearing, and she's a pediatric sexual assault nurse examiner. So she firsthand is witnessing the results of children getting access to porn at such a young age. And most of them, it's not intentional. It's they randomly stumble upon it. But let's check out her video clip because I think it's really powerful what she has to say. Is that the age range most likely to commit sexual assault right now are 11 to 15 year old males. Now, while problematic sexual behavior is a multifaceted issue, no doubt, there's a clear connection between repeated exposure to pornography and child on child sexual assault. Good afternoon, chair members. Um, I'm Heidi Olson. I'm a pediatric sexual assault nurse examiner. And over the last few years, I have performed or reviewed over 1,500 forensic exams of kids who have been sexually assaulted. A really disturbing trend that we're seeing at our hospital and that's being seen around the United States is that the age range most likely to commit sexual assaults right now are 11 to 15-year-old males. Now, while problematic sexual behavior is a multifaceted issue, no doubt, there's a clear connection between repeated exposure to pornography and child-on-child -child sexual assault. There are over 100 research studies showing there's a correlation and causational relationship between pornography and violence. Kids don't have fully developed brains. They're really susceptible to what they see in pornography. This is problematic because mainstream porn today is very violent and degrading, and it's the number one sex educator of our kids today. A recent study estimated that two-thirds of adolescents are currently addicted to online porn. Kids are accessing violent porn at mind-blowing rates. I just talked to a rural high school who monitored their 140 students' school-issued devices, and in one month, there were 13,000 hits to Pornhub. We are seeing numerous negative effects on tweens and teens from erectile dysfunction to glorifying sexual violence to increased child sexual exploitation and a fundamental misunderstanding of consent as pornography does not value intimacy or mutuality. The porn industry has a goal of making money. How do you do that? You create lifelong users. Research shows that the earlier a child is exposed to pornography, the more likely they will be lifelong users. So for those reasons, I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, 
how pervasive pornography has become and so sad that so many young people are getting addicted at younger and younger ages and parents, you know, aren't keeping up with technology. Um, and their your kids are constantly being lured in. Uh, and so we, we got to be vigilant. I mean, I think we're going to be embarrassed, uh, 10 years from now, just, we should be embarrassed now about how much, hardcore, ugly, awful pornography is available at with a, a few clicks of the devices we're giving our kids. Um, it's unconscionable. So glad to see the legislature is recognizing that. Um, that is a positive step. So absolutely. So like Greg said, this bill is going to be on the assembly floor soon. And if it passes that, it's going to go through the Senate side. So stay up to date with our newsletter, which you can sign up for at CaliforniaFamily.org, as well as our social media. So that way, you know when it's time to start calling some of the senators that are in the committees that this bill will get put into. But with that, there is a bad bill we have to talk about. SB 233. This bill was recently introduced um, as a result of what's happening in Arizona. And so you would think, why does what's happening in Arizona, why is that affecting us? Yeah, that's a good question. We're kind of wondering the same thing. Why our legislators feel the need to get involved with this? But in Arizona, since, or what we've seen across the nation, since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, a lot of, not a lot, but some states across the nation have had pre-Roe laws into place that were protecting the unborn. And so a lot of them went back into effect once Roe v. Wade was overturned with the Dobbs decision. And in Arizona, that was kind of what we saw happen. They had a law from 1864. So Roe was instilled. Um, Roe became the decision of the Supreme Court in 1973. So this was a pre-Roe law that protected the innocent. It basically said, unless the mother's life is at danger, you cannot have an abortion. You cannot kill an innocent baby in the womb. And Arizona, we've seen kind of go back and forth with their last election, um, a switch in the governor and the party of the governor. And so they've just been dealing with a lot of fights and battles, this being one of them. The courts in Arizona decided to uphold this law of theirs and so when that happened, the California legislators said, whoa, 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 we don't want our neighboring, one of our neighboring states to not have access to abortion. And so they stepped in with SB 233. Um, SB 233, it's pretty simple. What it's saying is that Arizona doctors can come across state lines to bring their Arizona patients to California to perform an abortion. And so, and it's for, and it's very clear. It's not for any other thing. It's not if the mom needs surgery to help the baby or anything like that. It is for abortion only. So California legislature, the California Women's Caucus actually rushed forward with this. And what's interesting, Greg and I were talking about this earlier, was unfortunately in Arizona, their Senate and House both voted to repeal the pre row law. So those life-saving restrictions are now gone. California is still moving forward with the bill because even though they repealed it, that does not go into effect until 90 days after their legislative session in Arizona is over. That means that you still in Arizona not have an abortion, I believe past 15 weeks, unless the woman's, the mom's life is in danger which that doesn't happen. We have a lot, there's a lot of studies on that, that that's not the case anymore, but that's not going to be repealed officially until about end of October, November-ish. So California is moving forward with this bill to allow Arizona doctors to bring Arizona patients to California to have abortions through November 30th, 2024. And it's just crazy. I mean, it really shows, Greg, maybe you want to touch on this too. It just really shows California isn't trying to help women. They are truly, the California legislators are truly pro-abortion. Right. It, and the, 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 if you listen to the language of them talking about it, you know, the, the Governor Newsom had a press conference with 
the California Legislative Women's Caucus, and they made it sound like Arizona was preventing um, the care, the health care that women need to save their lives, right? It was putting them all in danger. In danger from what? In danger from pregnancy, as though pregnancy is some type of disease that you need abortion uh, to as a, as, a, as a cure, right, for the disease. Ignoring that there's a life and other life involved. Um, you know, all the language is all changed to, to, to make it sound like uh, they're saving women's lives instead of ending children's lives, right? It, you know, and it, it makes Cal this world has become very inhospitable to children, mm -hmm. right? We, we don't welcome children into the world uh, with joy and excitement anymore. Right, especially if you're not planned. If if you if a child is inconvenient, it, it showed up in in a way that um, you know you you didn't want. Um, even when they talk about rape, right? Rape is an awful crime. They should be going after the rapists and throwing them in jail. But the the only thing they want to talk about is killing the only the innocent party involved, uh, punishing the wrong person uh, for the crime of rape, and so you know, pulling on people's heartstrings. I mean, they're, they're using that. They believe this, they're convinced the culture wants abortion, right? That, and they are going to give it to them. Right. And so it's like grandstanding. Like, do they have to do this? Probably. No. I mean, they don't now. I mean, but they're going to grandstand. Um, you know, no one's going to be prosecuted right now in Arizona for doing an abortion just because, <laughs> It's now legal again, but they grandstand. Um, and so we I just put means that we have to really talk about what abortion is all the time in our culture. Our, our, our pro-lifers need to educate the public, uh, reveal what abortion really is. Um, and we just, you know, we got to do a better job. We got a big job ahead of us. Absolutely. And we can... Um... We'll play a little clip from the beginning of the hearing, Assemblywoman Aguiar Curry. She is one of the co-authors on it, and she basically mm -hmm. straight up explains what is going on with this bill. She doesn't hide the truth that they're trying to bring Arizona people to California to kill children. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. SB 233 temporarily allows Arizona doctors to provide abortion care to Arizona patients in California. On June 6, 2024, Arizonians will face a total abortion ban because courts upheld a law that was enacted in 1864. Arizona has peel, appeal, excuse me, repealed the 1864 law, but the repeal doesn't become effective until late October or early November at the earliest. In the meantime, patients will be left without reproductive health care, and doctors providing care in Arizona will face two to five years uh, state prison sentences. Lack of access to safe, effective doctor-provided abortion means extremely dangerous conditions for pregnant individuals. Studies say that an abortion ban within the United States would lead to a 21% increase in pregnancy-related deaths, a 33% increase in pregnancy-related deaths among black women. This bill will help Arizona patients access health care by allowing Arizona's doctors to treat patients from Arizona but in California. Under this bill, an Arizona doctor would need to meet specific criteria to practice in California. They must hold and verify that they have a medical license in good standing from Arizona and have performed at least one abortion under the Arizona license within the last two years. Pending the ballot measure coming this fall, California should allow Arizona patients to access care with standards that respect the rights of patients and the ability of doctors to serve their patients without the threat of government interve intervention or criminal penalty. It's funny how she talks about respecting the rights of patients. Um, you talk to any doctor. Whether they want to admit that it is a human being, a little baby, and a live child, they do have to admit they are treating two patients. 
once, once the baby has a heartbeat, which is actually fairly early on in the pregnancy, the, most of the time a baby has a heartbeat before a woman even realizes she's pregnant. Once the baby has that heartbeat, the doctor isn't just tracking one the one heartbeat, it's not just checking the woman's, it's also tracking the babies. It is two separate patients. And why do these doctors, why do these legislators not believe both of them should be respected? And something that whole entire hearing, it's pretty short, it's actually only about a 10 minute hearing, is on our YouTube channel. So you can check that out. But Assemblywoman Pellerin, she actually spoke out during that hearing. And I honestly had to laugh at what she had to say. She sat there and said, because of Roe v. Wade being overturned, because of the abortion restrictions going on in different states, her daughter currently today has less rights of a as a woman than she did when she was her daughter's age. Please tell me what rights of mine have been taken away. I don't all the rights I have are the same rights my mother had when she was my age. Nothing's been taken away. It ultimately, the states that do have these abortion restrictions, all they've taken away is the right to murder. And I don't believe that we as human beings have the right to murder an innocent baby in the womb. Right. And that's what abor right to abortion is. That's what they've lost. The right to decide whether their child lives or dies. Right. And so, but, you know, we, we have a, Declaration of Independence that said, you know, unalienable rights to life. That was one of the reasons we have a government is to protect each individual person's life, right? And those are lives in the womb, and uh, they deserve to be valued. And I always found it strange. Did you? Did you? Did you? You got to catch the language. She was talking about having doctors uh, come to California to give out treatment treatment like abortion is a treatment a treatment for what right that that's a language uh that you use for the disease or an illness right but this, uh, abortion is an elective procedure it's not a treatment for it's like a having a you know uh something you don't need to survive <laughs> it is it's not it's an elective procedure um pregnancy is a natural process it is not the invasion of a disease that has to be removed you know for your health so it, it, there's so much lying and deception around this topic of abortion that that's why people get so confused right absolutely i mean if we're gonna just talk about the truth of what abortion is every single successful abortion ends in the death of an innocent human being and leaving another woman broken right that's what it is. And our legislators and the public want to lie and claim that that is health care. There is nothing healthy or caring about killing an innocent baby in the womb. All right, and why are we lying? Because we're trying to cover up reality. Because the reality of what we're doing is our conscience will be pricked. And we will, we will have a hard time sleeping at night if we tell ourselves the truth of what we're doing. And so... You know, it's the truth that sets people free. And so if you find yourself lying to yourself in order to do a thing you want to do, you got to realize you're on the wrong side. So those folks that are for abortion, if you're for abortion, you need to just say up front exactly what abortion is and what it does. And, and then let people decide whether it's right or wrong. If, if you find yourself having to lie and cover up what you're doing, you know, that, that, that should be some evidence that you're on the wrong side of this. Absolutely. Well, I know abortion has been something that we've been heavily focused on lately, just with the March for Life, with some of the bills coming down. But another thing that we've been really focusing on and fighting for is for parents' rights. And a right. lot of times when we've been talking about parents' rights, we've also been talking about the Attorney General, Rob Bonta, here in California, where it just really seems that he has made it his mission to completely take away parents' rights um, of their children. And we've had some updates, some good things, some bad things. But Greg, what is the latest with the Attorney General and parents' rights? Well, one of the ways we've been pushing back uh, on some of the plans of the Department of Ed and our state government. See, our state government um, is now 
telling uh, our schools that kids have a privacy right, no matter what their age is, they have a privacy right that the state is obligated to protect when it comes to their gender identity, right? What is a gender identity? Well, here in California, your, your sex is now chosen by, uh, you, can, you can be a, one of a multiple options for your gender or your sex. And so they're teaching kids this and more and more kids are looking, feeling uh, uncomfortable in their body. They don't think they meet the stereotype of a male or a female, so they think they're a different sex. And then they wanna change their name and pronoun. And the, the attorney general um, and our schools, uh, the Department of Ed is telling uh, schools that they must keep this secret for parents until a child is ready to reveal this to their parents. So they have to deceive them by calling them their pronoun of preference at school and then reverting to their real pronoun when they talk to the parents. Some teachers are just infuriated they're not gonna do it. And so we've been pushing notification policies all over the state, 10 different school districts have introduced policies to simply notify parents if a child asks to be identified as another gender. Bonta sued the first school district to introduce this in Chino Valley. Uh, Temecula has been sued. Um, uh, uh, Rockland Unified has been sued uh, by the Department of Ed, all under this guise that uh, the law mandates this. So, but a funny thing happened. Uh, two teachers down in Escondido, uh, Christian teachers, su sued the, um, their school district in federal court because they didn't want to follow this secrecy policy. They said, this violates my religious liberty. I will not lie um, as as part of my job and I uh, I will not violate parental rights. And so they filed a lawsuit under the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment, which protects parental rights. And a federal judge last September cited initially in their favor, saying they're right. And so uh, the school district protested and said, hey, you know, uh, we were just doing, uh, keeping this, we had the secrecy policy because the state government was telling us that's what the law said. So um, don't blame us. And so they added two new uh, defendants uh, to the lawsuit. And that was um, Rob Bonta, which is the attorney general and G Governor Newsom. And so a couple weeks ago, um, there was a hearing and Governor Newsom's attorney and, and uh, Bonta's attorney came in and, and said, hey, you can't sue us because, and get this, they admitted that you can't sue us because the secrecy policy is only guidance. It's not the law. And so, what? <laughs> that's, not what that's not what Attorney General and uh, the Department of Ed has been saying. Right. I mean, I want to read you what the Department of Ed has been telling school districts. This is on their website and it says school. This is this is supposed to be now guidance. And it says schools must consult with a transgender student to determine who uh, or will be informed of the student's transgender status, including the student's family. Right. That now it said the schools must consult. That doesn't sound like guidance. That sounds like uh, the law is telling them to do something. Um, but the attorneys uh, for Bonta, she said these were, and I quote, non-enforceable guidelines. And then she went on to say this: there is no one in the state who's actually, uh, actually going to enforce those guidelines. And to the extent that uh, the Escondido Unified School District believed it had to follow those, those guidelines as a mandate of state law, well, that's just an incorrect assumption. So, so now we have the Attorney General, when he's uh, held to account in federal court saying, hey, uh, these are just guidelines, but when he's talking to the rest of the school districts in the state, he's saying, you must do this or I will sue you. Um, and so I think, so we exposed this in an article. You can see it on our website. We published it on May 6th. Um, and uh, so now we're just playing with lawyers who are saying two different things in two different venues, hoping to intimidate school districts into 
uh, keeping secrets from parents, even though they won't defend it in federal court. So this is a big deal. Uh, I, I believe this is the beginning uh, of the end uh, for this these secrecy policies, and they're starting to admit it. Absolutely. And so, like Greg said, we have an article about that. So if you want to visit CaliforniaFamily.org, you'll be able to see all of our blogs, all of the articles. You'll be able to see our bill watch list, sign up for our newsletter. We send out a great newsletter once a week with tons of information on what's going on in California. Follow us along on social media. And we haven't said this on social media or anywhere else yet. So if you guys tune into the podcast, you guys kind of get to know the news first but if you are in southern california mark your calendar for september 28th we are going to be having our life faith and family gala in orange county so september 28th save the date put it on your calendar um we will be putting more information about that soon who our speaker will be all of that will be coming out soon but i just figured if you take the time to listen to the podcast that i'd let you in on our little secret about what's coming up but with that We will see you all next time. And once you're done watching, share this podcast with a friend. See you later.